So currently I'm uh, a postdoc at Northwestern. Um, I'll be at Berkeley in the fall and then I'll be joining Yale um, in January 2024. And this work was done with a number of wonderful collaborators at these institutions. Uh, Lakshman Dulipala, Sofia Raskolnikova, Jessica Shi, Julian Shun, and Shandi Yu. Um, and today I'll be talking about uh, differential privacy from locally adjustable graph algorithms. So I'll define each of these terms um, as I go through the presentation. Um, so I've been going around like a salesperson um, talking about uh, this paper. So the key things I want you to get from this presentation are the model, so the local model for graph privacy, which I think is a very underexplored model and a model which I'm very excited about. And hopefully you also learn about some of the techniques we use to obtain privacy, uh, privacy in this local model for graphs. Okay, so let me start off with some motivation for this model. Uh, and to start off, let me tell you why we care about privacy on graphs. So graphs uh, are often used um, to represent relationships between individuals. Um, so you can have each node in a graph represent an individual and the edges between these individuals represent some kind of relationship. So there are a number of uh, things that are sensitive connections between in individuals. So some of these uh, examples are shown on, on the slide. So oftentimes people publish these uh, graph data sets as anonymized data sets. So you have the, have the exact connections, but the nodes are not labeled with identities. Uh, but as we all know, anonymized data sets are not necessarily private. So let me give you an example of one such data set. So suppose um, you have a, the COVID transmission data um, from the beginning of the pandemic for each of your institutions. Um, and suppose you just have the COVID transmission data for, for the theory group specifically at your institution. So that's not a lot of people. Um, and especially if you were one of the super spreaders, probably you don't want this data to be public, even if it is in anonymized form. So one way that um, people protect the privacy of these connections between individuals in a graph is through some privacy mechanism. So the private graph is given to some trusted curator, and the curator is responsible for answering some number of queries from users. So these users could be completely legitimate individuals, like researchers, government officials, businesses, or they can be malicious adversaries who are trying to do something bad with your data. So because of these uses, you have two conflicting goals when you're trying to obtain statistics from this private graph. So the first goal is to obtain as accurate outputs as possible for the people who are using your data for um, good purposes, like researchers, businesses, etc. cetera. Um, and the second goal is to protect the privacy of these users from these malicious adversaries. So obviously these are conflicting goals because the more privacy you provide, the less accurate your outputs are. And the more accurate your outputs, the less privacy you protect. And in order to talk about privacy, let me give you the formal definition of privacy that we're gonna be using for this talk. And the formal definition of privacy that we're concerned with is this central model of differential privacy. So this is generally known as the gold standard for differential privacy within the theory community. And intuitively, it says an algorithm, a randomized algorithm is epsilon differentially private if for neighboring inputs, it outputs the same output with approximately equal probability. So this definition is param parameterized by this uh, parameter epsilon. And the smaller the epsilon, the smaller the difference between the probabilities. The larger the epsilon, the larger the difference between the probabilities. And specifically for this talk, these neighboring inputs that we're going to be talking about are edge neighboring graphs. So edge neighboring graphs are graphs that differ in exactly one edge. So the privacy that we're protecting is any one edge in the graph. So we're protecting the privacy of any one of these edges in the graph. 
So one of the key assumptions of the central model of differential privacy is this assumption of a trusted carrier. So we're assuming that this trusted carrier completely keeps the graph private. Unfortunately, um, as we can see through these uh, data leaks in the past 10 years, um, this assumption is unfortunately a bit unrealistic in today's world. Uh, so I've listed some of the major data leaks on this slide. Um, and it, these companies can even sell your data completely legitimately through commercial data trading. Um, so because of this reason, we want um, a weaker lotion of trust. So instead of inputting the entire private graph to the trusted carrier, now we assume some untrusted carrier. So the carrier no longer has access to any of your private information. And instead, each node publishes some privatized outputs. So each of these nodes now runs an algorithm and no longer reveals their private information. So the private information, again, is the set of its neighbors. So each node is uh, responsible for running some private algorithm and then outputs some privatized answers. So the curator no longer has access to any private information, and the only role of the curator is to compute some aggregate statistics using the privatized outputs that the nodes output from their private algorithm. So now, this is um, the strongest notion of privacy we can possibly have because individuals no longer trust their private data with anybody. So individuals trust nobody with their private data. So let me now define um, this notion of local privacy for graphs more formally. So we define this notion of local edge differential privacy and local edge differential privacy relies on this definition of a local randomizer. So an epsilon local randomizer is an epsilon differentially private algorithm that takes as input an adjacency list, A, and this adjacency list is your private data, and some public information, and it outputs private, uh, epsilon differentially private outputs. So here's an example. Uh, so we have this local randomizer, R, for this node A, it takes as its private input this adjacency list of A and some public information and outputs private, privatized outputs. So we can run uh, a distributed protocol using these local randomizers. And the distributed pro protocol works as follows. The untrusted carrier first gives each of these nodes some public information. So this public information is represented by X. Then each of these nodes runs their local randomizer. And the nodes run their local randomizer with their private input, which is the adjacency list for each of these nodes, and also the public information X. So each of these nodes runs the local randomizer algorithm and then outputs some output back to the uh, untrusted carrier. So the untrusted carrier then takes that output and then computes some new public information based on the outputs from the previous round. And then the algorithm, uh, then the nodes can run the local randomizer algorithms again using the new public information um, and again using their private information and then give back new outputs to the untrusted carrier. So that you can run this algorithm in rounds via some distributed protocol. And because you're running these algorithms in rounds interactively with the, with the untrusted carrier, the relevant complexity measure that we care about is the number of rounds of communication. So at the end of the algorithm, the untrusted carrier takes all of the outputs from all the rounds and then computes some aggregate statistics back to the users. Yes? Should I be thinking of the like, public information that the curator sends back to the nodes as truthful or also potentially like, adversarial? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so the question is, should I be thinking of, about uh, this information as truthful or potentially adversarial? So currently for the models that we're looking at, we're uh, completely trusting all the players. 
So everybody sends truthful information according to the protocol. So, so is, yes. Is the distribution model important for your privacy also? I, I think like, uh, are you assuming this uh, loop randomizer as number three, or like basically you partition the graph and only give part into in, to, to to one like uh, loop randomizer, right? So is that important for the privacy also? Uh, so the question is whether the distributed model is uh, important for privacy. Um, and it is because we're assuming that nobody else knows the adjacency list of the node. So we're assuming each node is a server. And th the reason that that is important because is because we're assuming that each of the servers maintain their own private information. So um, we have to assume that each node is its own individual server because we're assuming that no other nodes besides, I guess, the the endpoints of the edge knows that the edge exists. So the distributed part is a product of our local model for privacy. Okay, great. So um, because we're running this distributed protocol, the um, relevant algorithms that we're trying to compare against are the algorithms for the problem in the distributed model that are non-private. And using these local randomizers, we can define this local edge differential privacy definition. Uh, and this definition states that uh, a randomized uh, algorithm A uses potentially different local randomizers on the nodes that are the endpoints of each of these edges. And this algorithm is epsilon differentially private if the sum of the epsilon parameters for each of these randomizers uh, for the endpoints of the edges. So the sum of these parameters is upper bounded by epsilon. So each time you run this local randomizer, you, you lose some amount of privacy. So you want to make sure that the sum of the amount of privacy you lose is uh, upper bounded by epsilon. And as I mentioned before, um, this is a very understudied model of privacy for graphs. So this is all of the um, previous work on this model. And the only theoretical works um, besides ours um, are this set of uh, works. And specifically, for all of the other works, uh, they have focused on this problem called triangle counting. Now, the problem with triangle counting is that the gap in the error between the central model of privacy and the local model of privacy that we have, there is a polynomially sized gap. So for the central model, um, there's a trivial algorithm that gets O of n over epsilon, um, additive error. But for the local model, we, show, we showed that for the interactive multi-round case, uh, you need at least n to the 3 halves over epsilon additive error. If you only have one round, the error becomes quadratic. The previous slide? Yes. Uh, no, before this. Sure. Here, why are there more number of randomizers? Like, why do you need, like, J randomizers per node? Ah, so the, uh, the question is, why are there more randomizers? Why are there J randomizers? So these are randomizer calls. So if you have an interactive protocol, um, each round of a protocol, you might call a number of randomizers. So these, the, the randomizers that you call for each round of the algorithm might be different randomizers, and they can be different randomizers. So the J randomizers are the randomizers that you call over J rounds of the algorithm. J not equal to L? Sorry? Is J not, not equal to L? J might not necessarily, so the question is whether J is equal to L. J might not necessarily be equal to L, depending on whether the node calls a randomizer in that round. So J is upper bounded by L. So you call at most one local randomizer for the node each round, but you don't necessarily have to call a local randomizer every round. Yes? This is maybe more of a philosophical question, but like why, why is like adding these, I mean like each of these things really corresponds to like some probability and you're adding things here. So should I think of this as like, you, you want to like union bound over whether or not yeah. the adversary. Yeah. But like theoretically, like 
these things might be independent and then? Yeah, so the question is whether um, adding is a correct operation here for, uh, for bounding the privacy loss. Um, generally, generally, in the central model, we also add the probabilities. It's, this is due to the composition theorem. So um, if you work in central privacy, there's composition theorem such that if you call some private algorithm um, over that many calls, you add together their, their parameters. So this is a natural notion to follow for the local model. Um, so as I mentioned, um, these other works, uh, the pitfall here is that uh, the, unfortunately, the additive error has a polynomial gap between the local model and the central model. So the natural question we ask is then, does there exist some epsilon LEDP algorithms for graph problems where the multiplicative error matches the best distributed non-private algorithm for the problem and with only poly log n over epsilon additive error, so no po polynomial gap. Uh, in additive error? And we answer yes uh, to this question in our paper. And specifically, uh, we give the following set of results. Uh, so the first problem we look at is this k core decomposition problem, which I'll describe in the next few slides. And for this problem, we get a 2 plus eta multiplicative approximation algorithm for any constant eta greater than 0. And this matches the best non-private result uh, distributed algorithm for this problem. And um, we achieve only poly log n over epsilon additive error. So specifically, this poly log n is log cubed n. Um, and we do this in O of log n rounds, which also matches the number of rounds for the best known um, non-private algorithm. And we also, um, using a very similar algorithm, also obtain a 4 plus eta um, multiplicative approximation for densest subgraphs. So unfortunately, this one does not quite match the best known um, non-private algorithm. Uh, but in the central model, we're able to match this approximation, this uh, multiplicative approximation here. And in addition to this, using all these algorithms, we can generalize under a privacy framework, such that if you satisfy the uh, constraints of this privacy framework, we're able to give you a private algorithm. So the only, only pitfall of this framework is that we weren't able to prove an approximation guarantee for this framework. So we're able to guarantee privacy with this framework, but not an approximation guarantee. So it's an open question whether you can obtain a bound on um, the approximation for this framework. And for the rest of the presentation, um, I'll focus on this k-core decomposition problem. So let me define this k-core decomposition problem. So the k-core decomposition is defined in terms of the k-core. And the k-core is defined as a maximal subgraph where the induced degree of every node in the subgraph is at least k. So in this example, I've shown a three-core. Uh, and this is a maximal subgraph where every node in this induced subgraph has degree at least three. So now we can assign every node a quantity called the core number. So the core number of a node is the maximum core value of the uh, core containing the node. So the maximum value core in this example is a three core. So every one of the nodes in this three core has core number three. And here are the core numbers for every other node in the graph. So all of the nodes in the two core, but not the three core, is, uh, has core number two. And this one node that's not part of the two core has core number one. OK, so this is um, the definition for exact k-core decomposition. We can naturally relax this into a definition for approximate k-core decomposition. So we can give each node an approximate core number that is lower bounded by its exact core number minus d and upper bounded by c times the exact core number plus d. So this gives you a cd approximate core number for each node in the graph.
So here's um, an example. If you give the, uh, everything in this blue region approximate core number three, this is a three halves zero approximation for these yellow nodes because their actual core numbers are two. And if you give a approximate core number of two to everything in this purple region, this is a two approx, two zero approx because the actual core number of this node is one. And uh, for this paper, we care about two plus eta um, polylog n over epsilon approximate core numbers. And the key data structure we use um, is the set of uh, level data structures that has previously only been used for dynamic problems. And let me describe um, the non-private version of this level data structure. And I'll actually describe a much simpler version of the data structure because we're translating this data structure into the static setting. So for the static setting, we just assume that all of the vertices start off uh, with no edges and we add all the edges into, into the graph. Um, and this level data structure is exactly what it sounds like. It has a number of levels, um, specifically for log n levels. And you're partitioning the vertices of the graph uh, into uh, these levels. And the way that you partition these vertices is that you use some movement rule. And I'll demonstrate an example of this movement rule. So let me demonstrate an example. Initially, we set all of the vertices to be active. And the movement rule is as follows. You move a vertex up if the induced degree among the active vertices is greater than some threshold. And the specific threshold that we care about here is one plus eta. And for this, this example, I'll set eta to be 0 0.1. So first, I'll compute these induced degrees uh, among the set of active vertices here. And here are the induced degrees within this example. Now, for all of uh, these vertices that have induced degree greater than one, we move these vertices up a level. And now, once I've moved these vertices up a level, vertices which moved remain active. Vertices which did not move become inactive. And then we repeat this process. So we compute the induced degree, the new induced degree, among the vertices that remained active. And then we check whether they satisfy this cutoff. So specifically, if these new induced degrees is still greater than uh, one, and we move uh, the new active vertices again, according to this rule. So we keep iterating this rule until we either reach the topmost level or all of the vertices become inactive. So this is a movement rule for one of these structures. Now, having one of these structures is not enough to give us the desired approximation of our core numbers. So in order to obtain the desired approximations of our core numbers, we actually need multiple copies of these structures. And specifically, we, we need O of log n copies of these structures where in each of these structures, the thing that we change is the cutoff. So we set the cutoffs to be one plus eta to the i for all i from one to log n. And I've shown some examples of these copies here. So we, for each of these copies, we keep a copy of the node. So we duplicate the node for each of these copies of these structures. And we move these nodes simultaneously in all of these structures, but using the specific cutoff of each, each structure. So a copy of a node could be on a different level in each of these copies because the cutoffs are different for each of these copies of these structures. OK, so here are some examples. Now, using these copies, we're able to obtain um, the approximate core numbers. Yes? Can you repeat again why did you have to take these different copies? Yes, uh, we need these different copies because we need to obtain these uh, approximate core numbers. So the different copies have these different cutoffs. And recall, the cutoffs are responsible for moving the vertices in the levels of this structure. So, so 
Yes. Have you ever spotted the point that somebody has stops that wasn't giving you the core number? Or? Yeah, for the first copy, for the first copy, it doesn't give a, the first copy of the structure does not give you a very accurate uh, approximation for vertices that have high core numbers because the cutoff is too low. So I actually ex explain exactly how you use the cutoffs to get approximations, but the intuitive uh, explanation is the cutoff is too low. So for the first copy, it will not give you a very accurate approximation for the nodes which have high core number. Yes. So, yes. Is that the only function of the copies? Or does it play, like, does it have any, like, so if you could make the algorithm work without the copies, would that have any influence on the privacy guarantees? No. It's, the copies are only responsible for getting the approximations. Yes. So the, yes. the end result of this, like, you're, you're only able to estimate the core numbers, like, you don't actually give me a decomposition where the induced degree is approximately in its core number, or? Um, so the only function that we give right now is approximation of the core numbers. But not like an actual like You can actually. You can get. Okay. Yes. Um, that's a good question. So the question is, um, can you get a decomposition of the nodes into cores? So you can actually use um, the core numbers in the non-private setting to get a decomposition into cores. Uh, because you can just group the nodes by the core numbers, and higher cores are contained within lower cores. Does that, does that continue to be the case, though, when you want to get approximate core numbers, and then? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so the, uh, that's a good question. So the question is whether um, you, when you have approximations, do you uh, get uh, the core decompositions. So the exact cores will be contained within the approximate cores that we give. But this is only in the non-private setting. So privacy, private setting, you don't have the edges. So you can, all, you can still group the vertices um, by their cores, but now you have an additive error, which I'll talk about. OK, great. So, I talked about the cutoffs very intuitively, so let me tell you how to get the approximations from these cutoffs. So for each of these nodes, you take a look at the copy uh, where the node is in the topmost level of uh, each of these copies. And you give the, the approximate core number to the node of 2 times 1 plus eta to the i, where 1 plus eta to the i is the largest cutoff where the node is on the topmost level of that copy. So let me run through an example here. Suppose you're taking a look at uh, these nodes here. So I've highlighted all the copies of these, each of these nodes in each of these structures. So the structure with the largest cutoff where each of these nodes is in the topmost level is this cutoff, 1 plus eta to the 7. So you give each of these nodes an approximation of 2 times 1 plus eta to the 7. So here this equals 3.9, uh, which is a 2 approximation because the actual core numbers of each of these nodes is 2. So you directly use these cutoffs to obtain the approximation of the core numbers. Now let me tell you intuitively why this gives a good approximation. The topmost level of a node means that the node is adjacent to sufficiently many neighbors of sufficiently high degree. And the largest cutoff gives the largest such degree where the node is adjacent to sufficiently many neighbors of that degree. Um, and intuitively, intuitively, what this means is that all of the nodes on the topmost level have core number approximately the cutoff of that structure. And for all the nodes which never become part of the topmost level of any of these structures, we just give them default uh, approximate core numbers of one. OK, so now let me describe our private algorithm. So the private algorithm is actually a very simple change. But of course, the analysis is more complicated. So let me describe this simple change here. Recall that I said the structure depends on these movement rules. Now, each time you decide whether to move a vertex, you now draw an independent noise 
from a symmetric geometric distribution. So I've given the PMF for this distribution here. And you add this noise to the induced degree of the vertex to determine whether it now exceeds this cutoff. So let me run through an example. And you can, of course, draw all these noises simultaneously um, and independently. Uh, so let's take a look at this node i. So i needs to compute its induced degree, which is 1. But now it needs to determine whether it needs to move up. So i draws this uh, independent noise uh, from this distribution. And now this added noise plus induced, de induced degree exceeds 1. So we move i up. So you, you do this independently for every node. And then everything else proceeds as before. So the only change to the algorithm is that you will now be drawing a geometric noise. So the key with this geometric noise is that um, you can draw a positive, zero, or negative noise with equal probability. So now approximation is also obtained as before. So this is the only change to the algorithm. Um, so now, now let me prove to you the privacy and the approximation guarantees, both of which are the approximation guarantee. I'll only give a proof sketch. The privacy guarantee is quite simple to prove. So to prove the privacy of this algorithm, you just need to show that this algorithm can be Im implemented by local randomizers. So here is the local randomizer that we define. So we define the local randomizer R to take the private adjacency list and a public set of active vertices. Now this randomizer then computes the intersection of the private list with a public set of active vertices. And then you add geometric noise. So why does this work? This works um, based on uh, this definition of global sensitivity. So the global sensitivity of a function f, uh, which I'll denote as delta f, is the maximum absolute value difference of the output of the function on edge neighboring inputs. So the function that we care about is this intersection function. And the global sensitivity of this function is 1. Because for edge neighboring graphs, the adjacency lists can differ by at most one element. Um, and using the sensitivity, you can use what's called uh, the geometric mechanism to obtain um, a private uh, algorithm. So using the geometric mechanism, we can show that this local randomizer is an epsilon over 8 log squared n local randomizer. And you're calling this over 4 log squared n rounds, which is the number of levels in the level data structure. And so for each edge, the total number of times you're calling this local randomizer is 2 times 4 log squared n, so it's 8 log squared n. And so you get an epsilon LEDP algorithm. Um, and the proof sketch is essentially your noise is upper bounded by O of log square n over epsilon with high probability. And you can think of this uh, as either adding dumbing neighbors or subtracting neighbors. So if you draw a um, negative noise, then you're essentially subtracting neighbors, which means that if a vertex is on a level that's, less, that's lower than the topmost level, you're guaranteed with high probability that it has at most 1 plus a to the i, where this is a cutoff, plus O of log cubed n over epsilon neighbors. Uh, similarly, uh, you can lower bound this. So if a vertex is on a level that's higher than the bottommost level, then it has at least the cutoff minus O of log cubed n over epsilon neighbors. Uh, which means that if you draw a positive noise, you're adding some dummy nodes, but you don't add too many dummy nodes. And the key here for this proof is that the largest cutoff increases and decreases by at most an additive O of log cubed n over epsilon value. And recall, the cu largest cutoff gives you your approximate core number. OK, so we can generalize these concepts um, into this framework. So I'll describe a very high level uh, idea for this framework. 
Um, but our paper gives some more specific framework that can be applied to more algorithms. So this framework has a state for each of these nodes where a node's current state depends on the number of neighbors which satisfies some predicate. So the number of neighbors with previous state which satisfies some predicate. So now you can count the number of your neighbors that satisfies this predicate. And this count function has sensitivity 1. And you update your new state based on the number of your neighbors which satisfy this predicate. And because this count function has sensitivity 1, you can now use the geometric mechanism to get a private algorithm. So it's possible many distributed parallel graph algorithms has this local property. property. And because of this, um, you can obtain private algorithms. Uh, but a key open question here is whether you can uh, prove approximation bounds for this framework. So we only prove privacy, but not approximations. And here's a set of additional open questions. Um, so one of these specific open questions is, we showed a 4 plus eta private LEDP algorithm uh, for dense subgraphs. Can you minimize that gap? So we currently have a gap uh, of a 4 factor uh, between LEDP and DP in the multiplicative approximation. Can you show upper or lower bounds on the additive noise for additive error for each of these algorithms? And finally, um, node privacy is a major open question. Um, node privacy basically protects the private information of any individual in the graph. So neighboring graphs differ by any node and all of its neighbors. There is not even a definition for node privacy in the local model. So even coming up with a nice definition for node privacy is somewhat difficult. If you're cu curious about what the difficulties are, come talk to me afterwards. So even coming up with a definition is an interesting open question. So that's it. Um, sorry I went a bit over time, but thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Instead of the say exponential, ah, blah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. The, the, you can definitely use the Laplace noise because we're dealing with induced degrees. We just wanted to make the uh, additive value integral. Yeah. So okay. that's the only that's the only reason. All right. All right. Yes. Okay. So it's easier to work with because right. the the noise is an integer. Consider graphs that differ by one edge. Like, is that generalizations where you consider graphs that differ more, more number of Yes, um, you can definitely come up with the generalizations um, of graphs that differ by more than one edge. You can use the composition theorem when you have constant number of edges that differ. Um, for more, for greater than constant number, you lose privacy. Uh, so. Potentially, you can have algorithms that loses less privacy equal greater than um, constant number of edges that differ between graphs. But that would be, that would be a new model. I have one more question. So um, sure. here in the K-core algorithm that you were using, it's not like a traditional one. Like because the one you started with had approximate. You're computing an approximate K-core, but there are exact K-core distributed algorithms. Can you make this privacy work on that, those kinds of yeah, so um, the question is whether you can make um, this kind of <laughs> framework work for other types of k-core deco decomposition algorithms. Um, so the traditional k-core decomposition algorithm uses peeling. Um, so you iteratively remove the node with the smallest degree. Actually, there might be um, impending work, which I can't talk about, um, that actually uses the peeling algorithm to get a better approximation in the central model. So. Understand it fully. So can you go back to the slide with the sure. proxy analysis? So you want the model slide? No, the just the proxy analysis for the algorithm. Oh yes. That's not how. Sure. 
So something Here. that you mentioned there, the private adjacency list, where, yes. is, where is that from? The private adjacency list is held by the node. So the node knows its private adjacency list. So it's only the local list, it's only like my neighbors. Yeah, it's just, just your neighbors. Oh, I see. Yes, so that's right. I see. So you're saying that a local randomizer only works for that, that particular node only? Yes. Yes, a local randomizer is run by a particular node on its own adjacency list. Yeah. But for edge neighboring, um, no, edge neighboring graphs, the adjacency list of any node can only differ in one element. Yeah. So that's very useful. Yes. Nature. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I see. Any more questions?